meeting of the Children, Young People and Education Committee. I first of all need to give you the webcast notice, which you may be able to join in with. If you know. um, this meeting will be webcast and record retained on the Council website for up to two years. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting for your name, the content of what you say and your image to be broadcast and stored on the Council website. If any member, officer or member of the public addressing the committee has concerns with this, please contact committee services officer immediately. For those at home viewing the webcast, I would like to inform you that if you look above the video, you will see a resources tab. Select this and a link to the agenda will appear in the right hand side, which will allow you to open the agenda in PDF form and follow the discussion and debate. And within the room, can I please remind members that they need to turn their microphone on when speaking, otherwise what they say will not be captured on the webcast. And can I also ask that members turn their microphones off when not speaking to avoid microphone feedback. Thanks very much. So apologies for absence. I believe that Councillor Frost has sent apologies and Councillor Adrian Jones is here as a deputy. Everybody else is here, so thank you for that. Item three is member declarations of interest. Members, do you have any personal prejudicial interests in connection with anything which is on the agenda? And if so, would you like to state that now, please? Okay, that's very straightforward. Thank you, let's move on to item number four then, the minutes of the meeting held on the 27th of October. Are, are we content to approve those? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anything. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll move and Kate will second and we'll all. Did you want me to sign them? Oh, Ooh. <laughs> okay. All right. That's great. So then we move on to item number five, which is public statements, questions and petitions. We have received a question from a member of the public and um, I will read their question out to you as they're not able to attend this evening. The question reads, the Kingsway Academy PFI contract costs Wirral Council £865,000 a year for the facilities management company to change a light bulb or paint a door. The building can only be used for educational purposes, so Wirral Council is sensibly exploring Claremont Specialist Sports College making a move there. However, Wirral Council has a budget gap of £16.5 million to plug to satisfy government commissioners and the SIGFA external quality assurance report told the council to sell assets such as Wallasey Town Hall. It's a long question. There are considerable financial pressures upon Wirral Council to continue to meet the £150 million nine school PFI contract, offset by, 90, by sorry, £50 million worth of PFI grant until it's finished in 2031, as well as the pressure to set a balanced budget. Taking all this into account, how much additional funding will Wirral Council be committing to making the Kingsway Academy fit for purpose for the needs of young people with a range of special educational needs? And where will any additional funding for the new special school be coming from? I'm going to ask Simon to respond to that, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Wirral Council are keen to develop a way forward and to make sure that Kingsway School site can be repurposed effectively. The site has remained empty now for several years. The facilities inside are of a high standard. And for this reason, it's very important to us that it is utilised well for rural residents and for the benefit of children and young people. We will be conducting a full feasibility study and that assessment will consider any alterations that need to be made and will allow the build, to allow the building to be used by anybody who moves into the site. The cost of alterations will be articulated as part of the business case and will be considered as any plans move forward. The driving aim of the feasibility study of Kingsway School is to allow the site to be used again and once again to become part of an excellent education offer on the Wirral. And we would ask you to bear with us while that study is undertaken, as I believe that will answer your questions around costs and future of the site. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And that is an item which we shall come to later on our agenda. So now we are at item number six, which is about the Early Help Alliance report to award. And Elizabeth Hartley, Assistant Director for Early Help and Prevention, is going to present the report. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Uh, this report was presented seeking agreement to conclude and award a commission for early help services for children and families. It is anticipated that this commission will continue to reduce demand for statutory services, thereby making an important contribution to the medium-term financial strategy for children's services, that it will support the Council's prevention policy and community wealth building strategy, and it will put families in the lead, giving them the type of local, accessible support that they're asking for. For clarity, it's important to note that this commission will replace the existing Community Matters programme. Councillors will recall that in January 2019, we reallocated core funding from Children's Services to commission third sector partners to work with us to develop and deliver new early help services model. At the outset, the Community Matters programme was seeking to really understand why at that time the model wasn't working and why so many families ended up requiring statutory intervention and to co-design a long-term approach with third sector partners delivering and testing new ways of working. Over the last two years, we've really stuck to that plan. We've consulted with around 450 families. We've delivered support to approximately 2,000 families, secured additional external funding, completed a range of test and learn activities, and through a series of conversations and workshops, which are detailed in the engagement section of this report, we've worked together to develop this new approach and the new uh, Early Help Alliance model, which is branded as the family toolbox. Appendix two in your pack uh, gives you a copy of the Alliance Prospectus, which has full details on the family toolbox that we intend to commission and how it will work. The prospectus is actually the document that we've put out onto the chest for interested providers to um, tender to. Um, we thought it was a, a good document to share because it really captures the ethos, the values, um, and the brand of the family toolbox, as well as the desired outcomes for local families. There are a few key innovations in this model which I would like to highlight. Firstly, that this model is referral free. Families will make their own choices, lead on their own support and their own self-assessment and their own plans. This will help us to reduce waiting lists as families can get started straight away using the self-assessment, the website, the online tools and directly access and universal provision across the borough. The model will also operate without thresholds, so any family, um, whether they've been engaged with services um, or not, whether they currently are, or they've never been known to services, can access this. And because it's owned by families and built around a community and online offer, families can access as much or as little as they'll need. As well as this being a new model for delivering support, the Alliance has a new approach to commissioning for the Council and for Children's Services. The report details the background work that's taken place with colleagues in the third sector, with our own procurement team and our own legal teams to select this approach. We've taken advice from a national expert on Alliance contracts and we've worked to mitigate risk as detailed in section seven of the report. We have a work plan ready to ensure that the Alliance will align with other programmes such as the Community Connectors and a communications plan to ensure a smooth transition from Community Matters to the Family Toolbox. Uh, and finally, I would just like to note that this marks really positive progress in our early help strategy. It's building on the success of over two years of work with the Community Matters programme, and it responds directly to what families are asking for, as well as creating capacity and trust in our community sector. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, 2019. <laughs> It really does seem like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? But you've achieved an awful lot in that time, albeit through COVID as well as everything else. Um, and this really does sound very exciting. Do many members have questions, Chris? Thank you, Chair. Um, 
yeah, it's a really good program, Chris. I'm really pleased to see it's progressing so well. A um, couple of quick questions on financial stuff. I'm a bit confused. It might just be me, actually, uh, Elizabeth. But it says the envelope was 670,000, and it's now 705. So it's already gone up a bit. And on page nine, it does says it's initially 705 for five years. When it says it's initially five, does that mean it could be more or could be less or? Is that fixed for the f for the three years with the options of the two years to be reconsidered or at the same cost? Is that okay? Thank you. So the initial envelope was 670,000. Um, we did look across other commissions within children's services that could become part of this. So there was another commission that we've making part of this which extended the envelope to 705. Thousands. Um, the contract is for five years within a further option of plus two, plus two. Sorry if I may check. So is that a fixed price for that contract of five years or is it negotiable? It would be fixed. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, I did notice that um, you pointed out how cost effective this is as a programme, Elizabeth, and um, that's really positive to the committee as well to see um, that not only is it good for families and what they're looking for and they can access it easily, but there is that cost effective aspect to it as well. Um, so with no further ado, I would like to move that we accept the recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Jubi Chris, thank you very much. Uh, you all agreed? Yep. Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Then we can move on to item number seven, which is the budget workshop update. Um, is Mark going to speak to you? He's in here. Is it Nicholas? Yeah. Councillors, um, so this um, item just to give some review and feedback on the budget workshops, uh, which we we'd had. We'd had uh, three workshops, um, and the um, just to, to agree the recommendations and the savings that um, uh, and pressures that were reported uh, in the workshops. Um, it, it, it's important to note that um, we've had the workshops in the context of um, the recent developments that we've had with um, the, the SIPFA report and um, the need to balance the budgets. We've, we've had a thorough process where we've looked at what we think um, our needs will be going forward. We've looked at um, our overall position, our um, benchmarked with other neighbouring councils. Um, we've looked at where we think we are um, and that's a very um, thorough position. Um, in terms of the uh, um, outcomes, um, we, um, in terms of the sort of um, recommendations and detail, um, things that were agreed, we signed off um, a residential accommodation strategy saving. Um, during the first workshop, um, whilst we looked at a number of issues, there were a number of uh, proposals that had been on previously that um, 
when looking at us um, and comparing benchmarking with other councils and, and looking at the detail of where we are, we decided to uh, recommend it that um, we, it would be better not to go forward with them. Um, with, and then we also came up with uh, a few new ones. So we've um, listed out a um, number of cost reduction proposals, totaling um, 1.9 million. Uh, we, we feel we've got um, some pressures, which have been listed out as well, um, totaling thousand um, and um, we think it's been a very robust process very challenging it'll be very challenging we've also looked to um, over a number of years we've got over three to four years as well um, and, and uh, uh, so we, we think it was challenging we think it's achievable I think that's the sort of process we have. Does anybody got any questions? Thank you for that. I think that um, we all felt that when we came to the workshop and discussed that we were seeing um, something much more robust than we'd seen before and we could um, see clearly where savings were looking to be made. I mean, obviously, uh, life might have moved on somewhat since we had those workshops. <laughs> I uh, don't know if the director would like to comment. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to make a few comments. First of all, I'd like to thank members for their engagement at the workshops and just to set out our key strategies around children's services. We know from our benchmarking in our work that the most cost-effective children's services nationally are those that deliver good and outstanding services, and we are very committed to doing that. We've been able to demonstrate through our benchmarking that our cost of care, our residential care, and our fostering are actually very cost effective and I think members will have seen that demonstrated through the materials we've produced. We've looked at why our costs are slightly higher in some areas and we aim to reduce those over time. Our costs are slightly higher in some areas because we have been in an adequate authority and during that time more children than would be ideal became looked after because they needed that extra support. As time goes forward, our proposals look at those children moving on appropriately as they turn 18 and leaving care with the support they need. But that does reduce our costs over time and we have set that out for a number of years. We continue to strive to be the very best we can be for children and young people and to use every penny that the council gives us in an effective way. And we will ensure that we stick within budget as that is as important as setting a budget in the first place. Thank you. Do any members have any questions, comments? Okay. So then shall I move the recommendations? Uh, would somebody like to second them? Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Councillor Cannon. And uh, are they agreed by everybody? Agreed. Fabulous. Let's uh, move on then. Let, let's, let's thank um, Simone and the team for the, um, the hard work that goes in, and Nicholas too, um, to working up these proposals and looking really carefully at our financial spend, but still keeping children very much at the heart of everything that goes on. So we come to our budget monitoring quarter two report. I think you might be going to speak to this as well, Nicholas. Thank you. Um, hello again. Um, uh, this uh, item is to with the budget monitoring quarter two um, and the recommendations to note the forecast position of 739 million favorable um, achievement of savings the reserves position and the capital um, just want to remind members of the budgets that we have uh, we've got gross budget of 98 million across the service uh, and, and once you adjust for income, it's a net budget of 86 million. We've got the DSG schools of 186 million 
and the capital budget of 5.7 million. Um, looking at sort of the detail, um, the, the children's and family social care part of the service um, with a budget of 50 million, 50.4 million, um, has an adverse variance of 34,000, which is quite even more or less on budget for the size. Um, and just to note that the significant budgets in that service, um, the employee budget there is 19.7 million, uh, cost of care is 24.4 million. The employee budget um, has a slight adverse variant, variance. The cost, uh, the cost of care also has a slight adverse variance. Um, the service it is doing it is using external funding quite well uh, and some external funding that has been secured is, is helping to to um, bring that budget back into balance um, we're expecting that um, our looked after numbers are starting to decline uh, and this feeds into our strategy for next year as well um, so it may be that in, in, as we go forward that we might start to forecast less, but at the moment it's, it's being forecast to balance. Uh, the early help service has got a favorable variance of 650 million. Um, again, it's mainly used due to use of grant funding very efficiently and they're very good at getting income and grant funding in the service. Um, and there've been some vacancies that have arisen during the year that haven't, well, it, it, by the nature of vacancies, it, it can take time to fill. We can't fill them immediately, and that's also contributing towards favourable variance. Um, Modernisation and support um, has a similar position in that um, vacancies are rising and time taking to fill has led to some uh, favourable variances. Um, the uh, council-funded part of the education schools uh, budget uh, as an ad adverse variance of 126 million uh, and the main pressure in that service is the school's PFI um, and some of that has been mitigated, partially mitigated um, with uh, a reducing budget which is relating to teachers historic pension costs. Uh, again, this teacher's historic pension cost is one of the uh, savings that we've put forward for next year with a feed through there. Um, uh, moving on to the um, schools budget, the uh, actual dedicated schools grant, which is the real um, uh, school budget, the budget funding from school for schools. Um, most of the budgets are expected to be on budget. The, the main pressure area and the um, growing uh, pot potential to be pressure going forward is the high needs block, um, uh, where we're seeing an increase in requests for EHCP assessments and, and numbers of people with uh, special needs. Um, and, then, and that's expected to feed in uh, have an impact on our reserves, um, so our deficit balance. It, it, we were hoping to reduce it this year, and we won't be able to reduce it as much as planned because of the increase in spending on special needs on the high needs block. Um, going forward and looking at the savings, um, we've got a number of savings, and we expect to achieve on on all on. on almost all of them, or all of them, um, one of them with uh, mitigations. Uh, we're just quickly going through semi-independent living saving. Uh, we, we achieved that. Um, we've got a fixed price contract with a housing provider. It, we're doing very well with that. The, it's significantly better value than we would achieve with um, other providers in the full external market. Uh, as a result, we were able to make the, the saving and, and will do us well in future years as well uh, as part of our overall accommodation strategy. 
um, a modernization of social care efficiencies has been achieved by um, uh, looking at how we do things in, the team, in that team. The uh, children's uh, containing demand pressure mitigation is it, it, about how we um, have got better value out of current placements and also with the numbers um, trending downwards and how that's managed, that's uh, been achieved. Um, reduction in the youth service it has been achieved with the contract we have with the um, youth facility um, and the YOS one has been achieved as well. The, the POS project, the POS program has la launched later than expected uh, so that hasn't been achieved, but it's been mitigated with the use of m most of the other things that, um, about how, and other services, and we expect the benefits for that to kick in in future years. Um, uh, looking at our, um, there's also an item breaking down the how reserves, so just to note the current reserves and how we plan to use them. Um, and the capital budgets looking a bit different from what was reported at quarter two. Um, it's, um, the budgets have been reprofiled and spread over a, into a number of future years. Uh, last time it, it was quite big on, on um, favourable variances because almost all the money, so the money that's showing us 22, 23, or quite a lot of that was in the current year budget, so it's been spread over future years to try and make it more realistic uh, and so as a result we're expecting to um, virtually be on minimal minimal variance on, on in the current year but it does need um, looking at all the time because you know capital projects are, can can slip and plans can change by the virtue that fair nature of what they are and how big they are And I think, in general, that's uh, kind of um, uh, something I wanted to give us the um, budget. So I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions for Nicholas? Councillor Brennan, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Nicholas, for your report. Um, when you brought the quarter one uh, report, I asked at that meeting uh, whether uh, we could receive uh, reports of uh, year-to-date actual against year-to-date budget. And the reason why I asked that was because that would give us more assurance that the year-end outturn forecasts were well-founded. Um, the response I got was that that request would need to be uh, taken back uh, and discussed with colleagues. Um, in light of the... Um, recent external assurance review, I'm going to make that request again. Um, in future reports, can we have information about our year-to-date actual versus our year-to-date budget so that we can have assurance that the forecast outturn is well-founded? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brennan. Um, I did, I did um, have discussions with colleagues. Um, I think, as mentioned, the, the format we use is the format that's used for the PNR reports and uh, on all the other similar committees. Um, I'll, I'll take it back again to, to colleagues and to the Director of Finance as well, um, for them to, to I, I mean, generally, we, we in terms of, of using spend to date, we do use them in detail when we look at them at that, at, in, in detail level. But when you, when we look at them at this high level summary level, there can be because sometimes spend some spending in areas is not profiled. Uh, we might get income paid as a one-off, big amounts of income. The DSG may not come in in in, in set ways. It might come. And what, so it, 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 it cannot necessarily, don't necessarily, we can't necessarily uh, use it in the way you're saying at this sort of level because there, it, there'll be lots of questions. But I will, it, 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 because there's lots of different flows of how 
things come in. But, but definitely we'll take it back and we'll have the discussions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for that answer. Um, I think most of us, oh, well I hope anyway, are, are numerate and can, can deal with the notion of lumpy uh, profiles and um, income coming in at uh, times sli at slightly unexpected times. I, I think I'd be grateful, Chair, if you uh, could raise on behalf of the committee this issue at PNR, because clearly it's not just a matter uh, for this committee, it's a PNR issue, as Nicholas has just explained, because I think it would help uh, to give uh, members the assurance that we need when we're looking at how to earn forecasts. Thank you. Thank you. That's Well, that's something we can maybe discuss further, and, and it's about understanding from our finance colleagues what is the most helpful way forward, and I'll take your point. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any other questions, comments? Okay, so shall I move to the recommendations? Do we have a move and a seconder? Oh. Thank you, Cherry. Councillor Pobel's moving. Who's going to second? Thank you, Councillor Booth. There we go. Uh, we all agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Nicola. So now we're looking at our quarter two performance report and we've got Tricia Thomas, Thomas Performance and Improvement Manager, to uh, present that report. And can I say before you start, thank you for all the increased data that's available to us through Power BI. Very exciting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, councillors. Um, so the performance paper covers two areas the quarter two performance report and the latest developments in Power BI. So in terms of the performance report, which can be found in Appendix A, the data in here relates to quarter two, so period ends in the end of September. We have added to the report national, regional and statistical benchmarking data where available, so you can see how Wirral compares. We have strengthened the supporting narrative for each of the indicator groups, and this has been provided by heads of service and assistant directors and should explain um, any changes in performance and, when, and what is being done to address any areas of underperformance. In relation to Power BI, which is the Council's business intelligence system, I reported back in September that we have created interactive reports for the demand and keeping children safe indicator groups. Since then, we've been working on the send basket of indicators, as per Councillor Karubia's request, um, and we've made a start on the education reports as well. I don't know if anyone has had a chance to look at the SEND reports in detail yet, but they do contain the same indicators that you will find in the performance report in Appendix A. But it gives you the added ability to be able to view the data in graphical format and toggle between the different years so you can see how we compare on performance. As of all the Power BI reports, I've worked with Steve, sorry, I've, as of all the Power BI reports, there's an email address in the top right hand corner. So if you do have any questions or queries about any of the reports, you can click that link and it'll email the team directly. I've also worked with Steve Ruddy to make sure that there is a link embedded on the councillor's app so you can access Power BI directly from there now as well. We'll continue to develop the Power BI. Um, you'll have a full suite of reports available in there. So if we move on and we have a little look at the quarter two performance report, which is contained in Appendix A, and we start with the demand basket of indicators. You can see that demand for services has increased across social care and early help contacts and referrals to social care, but this has not reached the pre-pandemic levels just yet. And it isn't a trend that is uncommon, uncommon to see at this time of year as children go back to school. This doesn't cause us any great concern at the moment. And actually when I looked at the data earlier today, the new demand that is coming in is actually starting to come down slightly. However, what you do need to be aware of is the total number of children open to social care has not seen the same drop in demand. We are seeing less children coming in, but with more complex needs. So they are staying that's in the system a little while longer. So this is having, or it will have an impact on our social worker caseloads. So it's something to keep an eye on. Then when we look at the CP and CLA rates, in this report, the figures are relatively stable. 
However, when looking at the most recent data, we are seeing an increase in the number of children on child protection plans. But we are seeing quite a significant drop in um, the reduction in the number of children looked after, which is currently below 800, which is the lowest level it's been since July 2017. And this can be attributed to the low number of children that are coming into care, but also the impact of the work around placed with parents, the discharges, um, but also we have a higher than average number at the moment of children turning 18 during October and November. Um, so we're seeing more children actually leaving care. And if you cast your minds back to the recent budget workshops that Simone mentioned earlier, um, you'll recall a presentation which showed that, showed that Wirral had less children coming into care compared to our statistical neighbours. And just to give you the most recent data, as of today, the number of children looked after stands at 790, the lowest it's been in many years. Um, but again, when looking at the data <clears throat> at the end of October, that we, we also know that there are going to be more children turning 18 in the coming weeks, so we do expect that number to come down further. Okay. Just pause there before I move on to the next group of indicators. Is there any questions? got a comment I could make. I think this is absolutely brilliant. Love this. This is great, this stuff. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. No worries. Okay, so if I take us that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if I move on to the next group of indicators, which is looking um, around keeping children safe, the data presented, show, data presented shows a slight increase in the percentage of repeat referrals. But again, when looking at the data at the end of October, I know that this has come down slightly following the trend in the referral rates. And you can see that the data presented um, that Wirral's rate of repeat referrals remains below that of our statistical neighbours. Assessments completed within timescale and initial child protection conferences taking place within timescale, they've both seen improvements. And even more so now when I look at the most recent data, um, and this is all down to reviewing and improving our internal processes but also strengthening our management oversight within the department. We can also see there is a high uh, percentage rate of children open to social care that are regularly seen, which is great to report as well. Our youth justice data, the data that's reported within this report, it is lagged, which means there is a delay in the published data being available. But you can see that during quarter one, there were 99 entrants to the criminal justice system and a 40% reduction in children and young people re-offending, which is above the national figure of 36.5%. Again, I'll pause just before I move on to the next group. If there's any questions. Councillor Cook. I do apologise. I may have fallen behind. Uh, there are a lot of tables of data, and I think I may have lost my place. But if I can ask this question now, you'll tell me if I'm jumping the gun. And I suppose it won't matter too much if I've fallen behind, because you'll pick it up. It's just on page 83 of the tables, talking about, it's the, uh, what, uh, first, second, hang on, it's the, not the bottom three box, three rows yeah. from that table, but the, the ones that show percent, all start with percentage of visits completed with a statutory time scale, children in need, and it goes on to visits, blah, blah, blah. Child protection and visits completed within a statutory time scale, children looked after those three rows. Yeah, um, I was just assuming that the first three columns haven't got figures because it wasn't possible to keep track of that during the COVID period. It doesn't mean there weren't any statutory visits, right? And then the other one is because the word statutory enters into those three boxes where they weren't mentioned before, uh, that presumably means this is very important, it's to do with you know legal requirements and so on. So, I suppose my question really is. Looking further across to columns four, five, six, seven, eight, um, if you change those percentages into ordinary numbers like four out of five, you know, six out of seven, nine out of ten, uh, that's how many visits fell, in with the, uh, fell within that statutory time scale. So the fact that a certain proportion didn't, how serious is that? You know, are we failing in our duty? Are, are we breaking the law? You know, so just some reassurance on that. Thank you, Chair. Have I picked that one up? 
the statutory timescales, the statutory guidance sets out what the timescale should be for a visit, which, which is what we expect and adhere to. Uh, visits are, are always a little bit difficult at times because you can imagine occasionally a family has a crisis and needs to go out or something changes. Hitting 100% of statutory visits on time is, is always very challenging. But what we do is we monitor those situations where the statutory timescale has been exceeded. It is something that team managers, operational managers and service managers all have on regular dashboards. We look at which children were not getting that visit and we look at how quickly following the statutory timescales that visit actually happens. For looked after children, it can be quite different. For some looked after children, we know it's vitally important those visits happen, and more frequently than the statutory timescales, those children that are in, in placements that are new or where there is some sort of crisis. For some of our other looked after children, the statutory timescale is much longer because they're in very stable placements. They've been there for a number of years. Uh, the statutory timescale does also suggest that you know we need to see the child and we need to see the child on their own. That, of course, does depend on the age of the child. Some of our, our little ones are babies, so that isn't always a, <laughs> appropriate if, if that means taking them out of the room or whatever. So we aim to get as close to 100% as possible. There is usually a gap. I can say, though, that the children are also risk-rated and where necessary, those statutory timescales are not stuck to, they are ex exceeded. A lot of our children are visited on a two-weekly basis where, there's, where there is a risk, and every single child in this category is given that risk rating of red, amber, and green. So we would be most concerned. We would want to do 100% on time, but we would always be most concerned if we were missing any red children in that group, and I can reassure you that is not something that is happening at the moment. Right, thank you very much, Simone, for that explanation. Okay, so if I move on to um, looking after children well, and you can see that the number of children looked after who have had health checks, dental checks, and strength and difficulties questionnaires completed is continuing to increase. So the pandemic did have an impact on these areas, but we are starting to see these numbers rise again. Looking at the timeliness of adoptions, um, you can see that it's taken on average 912 days to complete the adoption process in Wirral. And that's against the national target of 426 days. Now, there can be several reasons for this. It could be that children have been subject to a placement order, but have only recently been adopted. Some children have really complex needs, and it's taken time to find suitable adopters. And each of these complex scenarios, making sure that we find the right placement for the child, which is the most important thing, it does impact our overall number of days to complete the adoption process. And again, we are aware of this and we do monitor it closely through um, Adoption of Merseyside. Um, um, finally, on this page, um, we're working with our colleagues in CAMS to access their data. Uh, particularly around waiting times, and we hope to have this information available to report to you um, next quarter. Okay. Okay. Councillor Cannon. Uh, thank you. Um, this is just, uh, a, I'm just trying not to state the obvious. <laughs> so you said that there's 70% of children, roughly, that are placed with um, uh, foster carers. So do I assume that the other 30% are made up with residential and children on care orders that remain at home? Do we know what percentage that is, roughly? Thank you. Simone, do you want to come in here? Or I can see you doing some figures there. <laughs> Bear with me one minute. I'm just trying to get the, the most recent breakdown of, of, of where our, our children are. Give me one... <laughs> So it's all right. It's um, the joys of waiting when my laptop opens. So we we have seventy percent, as as you know, currently in in foster care. It, I'm going to switch between that and sort of a numbers to give you an idea of where are the children are placed. We currently have a hundred children who are placed with parents, so they're on care orders and, and placed at home with parents. We then have um, a small proportion, and I'm, I'm switching, I know, because I'm doing two reports at the same time between percentages and numbers, and I know that's very confusing, of around 9% of our children who are in residential care. We have a, a, a very small number, and we are talking one or two children who are uh, remanded into custody, and it is very low. Um, 
and we don't give figures on, under five, but it is very low, I can reassure you. And we have um, 34 children who are currently on placement orders, which also count as our looked after children population, but don't count in the population placed with, placed with foster carers. So you can see that it's made up. What I can reassure you though, is our percentage overall of children placed in foster carers is, is really positive. It, it is higher than the England average. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris Thank Caribbean. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not sure whether this will be in your, your bit here, but on the bottom of that page where it's got uh, the reports are under development from CAMS, um, average waiting time for CAMS service, do you know how that's going to be broken down and what kind of waiting time? So I'm looking at things like time it takes to see child psychology or hearing or, or you know that kind of thing speech therapy yeah we're looking at all of those categories um the, the challenge that we've got without going into too much detail is because the data is held in two systems we've got to do a matching of the data so that's the the process we're going through at the moment we have access to the larger cohort of data but we want to be able to break it down into those categories that you mentioned but also to um, break it down by social care status as well. So I would anticipate that information being available to you in Power BI probably in the next couple of months, but we'll build it into this report for the next quarter. Thanks. Yeah, so Stuart. Um, thanks. This might be more for someone to, to answer, but just with um, the um, almost, well, if not excessive, it, it's doubling of um, the time it takes for adopt children to be adopted from this borough than the national average. Um, what is the implications of that from uh, external scrutiny, a government um, targets, things like that? And also, um, if you can give some reassurance about the implications that may have on adoptions falling through because it takes too long, or is it you know, the opposite, that it, it, it's more of a secure placement because it's taken so long. Cheers. Thank you, Chair. It, if you look at the data and you read across, you will see there's quite a sudden jump in, in the number of days it's taken. This target measures the time from a child coming into care to actually being adopted. So it, it is subject to a number of things that can cause delay. It will be something that we will be asked about by the regulator and we meet with Ofsted on an annual basis and have quarterly catch-ups with them and they, they will get to see this data and they will ask us about it. What Ofsted will do with the data is they will ask us to justify any change. Whilst Ofsted do take into account what is called the adoption scorecard in, in actually asking questions, they will want to know what the stories are behind. Now we know it, this is a small number of children and in this group, we have a number of things that have actually affected the target. And when Ofsted were in in 2019, we predicted and told them, so we can take them back to that, that this is what our target was going to do. Because this target is measured when a child is actually adopted. Uh, we had a number of children that were on placement orders that have been placed with prospective adoptive parents, but then went on to have a range of difficulties we know that those carers were particularly concerned about going through with the adoption until the full therapeutic package has been delivered. And that's because previously there have been concerns about the children, the delay in them coming into care and some of the issues. So we were able at that time to tell Ofsted about that cohort of children. We've also had a couple of successes, but they also affect the, that figure. In that, we've had a couple of foster carers who have had children for a long time who've approached us and said, we'd like to adopt. This is a child in our family. We want this child to be with us. But of course, if that child has been in care for a long time, when the adoption order goes through, unfortunately, for all the right reasons, it affects the time scale. So um, Ofsted will ask us, they will look at the individual detail of the children, but as long as we can justify what we are doing is in the best interest of children, they will accept that that, that indicator has moved in the direction it has. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the school's data. Um, there was a question at one of the previous committee meetings, and I think it might have come from Councillor Brennan, um, around free school meals. 
Um, so I thought it'd be helpful to provide members with some context here, which will hopefully explain why the numbers of children eligible for free school meals have increased over recent years. So the DfE put in place transitional um, protect protections to minimise the impact of the rollout of universal credit. And this meant that any pupil in receipt of free school meals on the 31st of March 2018 or after would continue to receive free school meals until the end of the universal credit rollout in summer 23. So even if circumstances change, the child would still continue to be eligible for free school meals until universal credit is fully rolled out. And I hope that helps to explain the trends over the last couple of years, Councillor Brennan. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I've got some detailed information uh, from you, I think, or one of your colleagues uh, on that. Um, what, what I'd be interested in seeing is um, what the inflow looks like. So clearly that applies to children in the system, but we can triangulate that information if we understand what the percentage of new entrants into the system claiming free school meals is compared to uh, their peers three years ago or whatever. And that will give us a view on whether there is actually a significant increase or whether it is entirely down to these uh, administrative uh, things that are, you've just explained. Absolutely, and Simone and I did discuss this earlier and we're gonna be undertaking an exercise to understand the impact that this will have, particularly on schools funding um, once the universal credit stops. So we'll come back and provide some additional information on that once it's available. So just moving on and looking at the attendance, the attendance data, we can see that 92 Sorry, oh. sorry. Um, sorry. Councillor Caribbean is waving at me as well. Thank you. It's okay. Um, I'm not sure whether you can answer this question, or maybe Simone can. I'm just looking at the figures here, and there's a, there's a, a, a nice downward trend on, let me get this right now, three and four-year-olds benefiting from funding early education. And I'm just wondering what the reason for that is, because it's a continuous fall. Well, I can understand things going down and then going back up because of COVID and not being open and stuff. But this is a continuous fall. And I'm wondering if that's going to be a trend that's going to carry on. And if so, why is that, you know? It's one, two, three, four. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Carabier, for your confidence. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to, to be light at this stage and say I will need to look into okay. that further before, unless um, my colleague can... No, uh, Elizabeth can't give us an answer. I was just stage. wondering whether it, it possibly because we've changed some of the programmes or, or, you know... I think there are a number of possible reasons. There are a range of change of programmes. There are, there are a range of different arrangements that have happened during the time of COVID. Um, but I, I need to explore it more further before I can give you a confident answer on what, on what has changed there. Okay, sorry about that. So, yeah, just looking at the attendance data, so we can see that 92.1% of our pupils were attending school at the end of September, and that is above the England average of 90%. Um, just moving down the report and looking at electively home-educated, so we know that the, we've seen a spike in this, particularly during the pandemic. Um, we know that 24 children started to become electively home educated in September, bringing our total number of children electively home educated to 245. Now, I know the, um, the data, I'm going to, following this meeting, I'm going to amend the report because I don't think that's clear within the report at the moment. So I'm gonna make sure that we have a snapshot and the year to date figure as well. And it's the same for children who are missing from education, missing more than 25 hours of education each week. So there were 37 pupils that started a part-time timetable during the first month of term. So what I'll make sure is that for next quarter, we build in the, the year-to-date figure in there as well. Th thank you, thank you, Chair. If I could just go back to the attendance uh, data. Obviously, it's... Um, Good news for us that attendance is higher than national, but I note that it's uh, two or three percent lower uh, than the pre-pandemic levels. Um, is that should that be a cause for concern for us? Um, 
we have regular uh, groups looking at the attendance and monitoring it and regular conversations with DFA. Um, it, it might be helpful to get a view from the, the service, though, in terms of uh, their per perceptions of that. Yeah, as you, as you note, it is higher than the national average, but we could probably give you a more detailed breakdown as to where we still have concerns, what are the trends, and what we're doing about that. Um, I, think, I think we agreed uh, earlier this year that we would have a, um, a COVID catch-up plan uh, come to this committee, and maybe that's one of the themes uh, that could be looked at. Clearly, if we've got... Um, uh, lower attendance rates even when we don't have lockdowns and so on which is like a carryover from what's happened in COVID then that would be of concern to us so maybe we could pick that issue up there if that's possible please okay so just moving on to the education indicators so when this report was produced in October there wasn't any updated results to report however we do now have access to key stage four results and what I would like to do is present this data to um, elected members at the next meeting, if that would be okay. Um, and then moving on to the next group of indicators, which is SEND. So the statutory indicator here is the number of plans that are issued um, within 20 weeks. Now, I know the report shows 17.26%, but a more recent snapshot of performance shows that in October, we were able to complete 40% within time scale which brings our year-to-date average up to 25%. Now, we know this is, this is still not an acceptable level and there's still quite a lot of work to do in this area, and we're still some way up, um, away from the national average of 58%, but we are slowly moving in the right direction with this. Um, to add to that, our... Oh. Could, could I ask... Um, the last time we talked about this, we, you mentioned you were taking on more EHCP writers. How many have we taken on so far, and how, how has that impacted our ability to get these figures right? Thank you. With your permission, Chair, we have taken on a number more plan writers. Uh, again, I do apologise. Uh, we were talking about a COVID catch-up, but my, my colleague, uh, James Backhouse, who actually would be able to tell you the figure off the top of his head, isn't here. I'm looking at another colleague across the, the room, just in case. Five? <laughs> There, there we go. That, that, that was telepathy of its finest. I didn't want to give you a de definitive figure and get it wrong. Uh, we've taken on five additional plan writers. We've also contracted out um, work around producing the educational psychologist report in order to speed that up. And I think the data shows we're, we're moving in the right direction. I think, though, as a percentage, it's always going to struggle because, of course, this year we do have a number of backlog cases and we're not putting them on the back burner while we just do new cases to get them. We're actually putting those through the system. So we, we don't anticipate we will, we will shoot up the percentage. It will stay relatively low this year, but if we can get up to a, an average of 40 to 50%, so we're getting both groups through and a, and a reasonable number, I will feel much more confident that we're beginning to deal with things in a timely way. And of course, once the backlog is resolved going into next year, it will be very different. Thank you. I suppose just on that as well, it's worth noting that our, our interim head of SEND is currently reviewing our 20-week process and we're looking at ways to address the delays, um, which can lead to the timeliness slipping. So we can be able to report back at a future meeting on where things are up to with that. Okay. And just moving on to the last page, finally, which is on workforce. So members received a focused report on workforce data at the last meeting, which included some of the initiatives around recruitment and retention. The data in this report shows um, an increase in social work vacancies and an increase in the use of agency staff. We have had 23 new starters, but we've also seen 29 staff leaving. And the average number of days lost to sickness currently stands at 16 days. And when we compare that to our statistical neighbours, Wirral's position remains relatively stable. The average caseload per social worker at the end of September was 14.9. And the most recent data shows that this has increased slightly and again, this reflects what I was saying earlier about the high number of children open to social care, particularly those with the complex needs where we might be case holding for a longer period. 
And then just the final basket um, on that page is around um, budgets and that's still to be developed. Now our aim is to have this ready for the start of the next financial year and we would look to include some high level budget indicators within this report so that members can see at a glance how we are performing. Now this will absolutely not replace, replace Nicholas's report but it will complement it and provide members with just that high level snapshot of the budget position. Thanks. I can see Councillor Brennan wants to talk budgets. Uh, no, Councillor Brennan wants to talk personnel, actually. But um, um, can, can, this average FT, FTE days lost, is that, is that the mean or the median? It's the mean, okay. I'm going to say. Uh, just, just, just on this measure, I, th I think, uh, and I don't know, whether your reporting systems enable you to do this, but I think a median uh, is a much uh, better number to help understand what's going on, because if you've got two or three staff on long-term sick, then that's gonna massively skew the average. So may maybe both the average, the mean and the median might, might help us understand a little bit better what's, what's going on there. Yeah. Absolutely, we'll take that on board, Councillor Brennan, and I'm working closely with colleagues in HR at the moment. Because this data is held in another system, um, we want to be able to access the information and interrogate it and present it at different levels and to different definitions. And also, this information presented is just for social care. We want to be able to view the data for across children's services as well. Thanks. Thank you. And Councillor Carabia? Yeah, so I'm just trying to get my head around these, the figures for the caseloads for social workers. I thought the national average was about 13 and a half, not 16.3. Is it? Has it gone up? We've got, well, our average is 14.9. I thought the average national was about 13. No. Uh, no, I'm afraid, Councillor Caribia, it's, it's, it's much higher than, than that. Uh, In that I, case, we're doing great. <laughs> we have been below the national average for some time. Our caseload figures now are up at the national average, so we are keeping an eye on them. We are very much an authority that is committed to low caseloads and high-quality work with complex cases, so we do monitor it very, very carefully. We know at times that's a great pressure, uh, and the average caseloads mask variations in the system, but we do think it's very important that we monitor it. Last year, I can say that we were running at 13.9, and to give you an idea, that put us at the lowest in our statistical neighbour group, and it put us the second lowest, you know, 22nd lowest in the country. So it, it gives you an idea where 13.9 sits. It's quite away from the, from the average. I think that's probably where I got my 13.6 from. And that's it for me, Councillor Clements. Um, I think we've probably covered all the questions today. Um, I'm sorry it's taken so long. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's a very comprehensive report. And I think councillors have had their opportunities to ask questions as we've gone along. So. Thank you um, very much. Um, so we'll move to the recommendations, which is to note the contents of the report. Um, I will move that. Have a second there, Councillor Carabia. Fabulous. Thank you. Do we all agree? Great. That's, thank you very much. Then we come to the Public Health Annual Report. Thank you, Julie Webster, our Director of Public Health, for sitting so patiently. <laughs> Um, and uh, we'll hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clements, and um, thank you for allowing me to attend this evening to present the 2020-21 Public Health Annual Report, which is the independent annual report of the Director of Public Health and is a statutory requirement. I know num a number of the councillors around the table have already heard me talk to this report um, this year. Uh, you are the last committee. I have been doing a roadshow of the committees because uh, we felt it was really important that each committee um, had the uh, report brought to their attention because obviously whilst public health reports into the adult social care and public health committee everything that um, all all the work of the committees all feed into obviously improving the health and well-being of local people 
And this report in particular um, is focused on the, um, describing the enduring health inequalities that we've got within the, within the borough. It also talks about the immediate impact of COVID-19 pandemic on these differences in, in health outcomes and makes a number of recommendations um, to improve everybody's health. And there's a particular chapter relating to um, children um, and their families. As a number of you have heard me say, the impact of COVID will obviously continue to evolve. And you've picked up on a number of those issues tonight, certainly going through the, the performance report. So what you've got within uh, the Public Health Annual Report is a snapshot of what we know now and what the impact um, COVID has had um, as, as of today. There is also a, a comprehensive technical document which supports the Public Health Annual Report. So for those of you who want to look into the um, data in more detail, I would like to um, refer you to, to that. Um, just some reflections from me, if I can. Um, COVID has been the biggest health challenge, challenge to affect us all for generations, uh, but many of the enduring health problems we faced before the pandemic have worsened as a result. And a reflection from me that, that I've, I have said before is that actually what this pandemic does, has done is, um, and is continuing to do is to hold up a mirror to existing health, economic and social inequalities in our borough. And unfortunately, I do believe I could have written this report two years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, and would have been saying very similar messages. But what I think the uh, pandemic and the work that we've done over the past 20 months has shown us that if we've got a real focus and if we work well together and we focus on outcomes, we can make a difference and we can make a difference really quite quickly. So whilst I think it's quite a difficult read the report and it's some hard facts in there, there is opportunities for, do some, for doing things differently. I was at the Regeneration Committee last night, just really talking to them about the amazing regeneration plans for the borough and just the importance of making sure that um, people and what's happening to people and the fact that our local residents need to see that they've got the aspiration and the ambition around the regeneration program alongside the physical builds that are happening. So it's not just about physical um, changes, it's also how do we ensure that our communities, our families, our children all see that what's happening within the borough is very much for them and that they've got a role to play um, in, in taking that forward. So I'm doing, doing my road show um, and the reason being is, and it's referenced in the report, obviously around the wider determinants of health. And I do believe that the reason that public health has moved into the council in 2013 was very much to get upstream of problems rather than um, trying, to take, trying to just focus on people when they were already poorly. Because actually what we really need to do is very much the work of this committee about ensuring that our children and young people have the best start in life. So the recommendations within the report, and as I say, I particularly bring your attention to those around children and young people. It's the work that Elizabeth presented earlier uh, with regard to the Alliance and the Family Toolbox. It's the work that um, we're doing with Elizabeth, Simone and the rest of the team around breaking the cycle it's, and, and the early help offer. There's also the work, and I mean, one of the, the things that's happened during the pandemic is um, certainly my colleague Jane Harvey has built up a a really good working relationship with, with head teachers in the schools. And so it's about building on those relationships and working with these different settings to really ensure that uh, we can help them, as I say, to achieve those am ambitions and aspirations for our young people. So you've got a copy of the report, you've got a copy of a presentation as well. Um, I'll probably stop talking now because, um, as I say, a number of you have heard me speak about this before. I do think, though, the pandemic, for all its challenges, has also brought us opportunities. We're still living through the pandemic. We still need to understand the impact that it's going to have. Our children and young people have been badly affected because of the, the fact that schools um, were closed for such a long time. Um, I think the comments around the COVID catch-up plan is, is definitely something uh, we obviously everybody would want to see and to really understand how we can make a difference there. So thank you for letting me come tonight. Hope you find the report useful to help shape the work of this committee, but also the other committees that you, you work on and absolutely make that link between health and wellbeing and, and the work of this, um, this council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. And um, 
Certainly it's good when reading um, your points around increasing support for children, young people and families, because we can see that, that so many of those things are in place. Um, they're effective for children and families. They uh, prevent other more deep-seated problems coming to the fore. And uh, I think we're proud of them. And thank Elizabeth and her team for all that they do as well. Councillor Caribbean, you've got a comment or a question? Well, it's a, it's a comment, actually. I was going to congratulate um, them because this may be a bit infantile, but in the eight years I've been a councillor, it's the first time I've seen Eastham in one of the maps, which is fabulous. It's on page 140. I'm just a bit annoyed that it's the level of nitro, nitrogen dioxide that's put us there. So um, what are we doing about CO2 and, and the effect of that up the Newchester Road? Because that's quite a, a, a problematic thing. We don't really have a lot of um, reporting on that, do we? We do actually do a, an air quality report every year, and um, Councillor, sorry, Councillor Booth actually asked me a question around that um, at a previous committee. So I think what I need to do is make sure that my colleagues from environmental health present that air quality report, and that you're made aware of what they're doing to uh, to um, mitigate against some of these uh, higher levels of uh, noxious uh, noxious fumes. Um, so I've, I've taken that action away to make sure that environmental health. Make sure that you uh, you understand the work that they're doing. Thank you. I'll forward your response to Chris. That I've got today. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. So um, then we'll move the recommendations. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Yes. Councillor Cannon, Councillor Carabia. Thank you very much. And that's great. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. So we come to item 11 on our agenda. This is about Kingsway School and it's a PFI update. Now, as James is poorly, um, David Armstrong, Assistant Chief Executive, has come to present the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I present this report. There's one, there's one correction to make to it, which is in the second paragraph, it says the contract was signed in 2000. And, and seven. In fact, the contract was signed in 2001. It's a year I remember well because it's the first year I was drawn into the PFI project. Um, and the contract has its origins in the late 1990s. It's a nine school grouped project. It includes the new Weatherhead High School, the new Liso Primary School, which sits next to the Kingsway building. Um, the City Learning Centre, which was built on this site as well, was included in the contract. Um, this is one school which closed in 2018, and this report is bringing forward an option to do a feasibility study to relocate Claremont School into this building. Um, and I'm really pleased to, um, given that given I've been involved with this for 20 years in various ways, I'm really pleased and grateful to Simone uh, and to James and to Hannah for bringing some renewed energy and, and a new sense of purpose about finding a new uh, life for this building. Um, we did start to look at this pre-COVID. Um, it did suit us last year to, to pause the work because we did earmark the building when things were really difficult in phase one of the pandemic. We did earmark the building for various options that it could have provided some emergency care space if other places had been overrun. We looked at it as a possible base for military. If we'd asked for military support, we looked at it for food banks and things. We also received, we negotiated with the De Department for Education, we received 1.1 million of additional funding to help offset the costs of the building being empty for the first two years. So we have a position where we have a, a very, very successful school, Claremont, which occupies a fairly restricted site in a 1950s building on a floodplain with a collection of other buildings around it. Some of the adaptations and alterations go back to my era in, in looking after school buildings. And only a very relatively short space away, we have a building which is in very good condition it was a good building to begin with, and it was the first building rebuilt under the PFI scheme before the then partner, uh, Jarvis, ran into difficulties with their rail work, so the work and, and, and we eventually ended up uh, exiting the contract. So the work was to a good standard. It's got all the facilities you would need for a modern secondary school in terms of specialist provision. It's got a good range of social spaces, dining spaces, sports hall, etc., etc. So the proposal is to look to see where the Claremont School could, fit, could, re, could relocate to the Kingsway site. Other options were considered. Um, the options are, are 
slightly restricted by the PFI contract, um, but the basic uh, tenor is, is that this is really good quality accommodation for young people. That if you've got a child at 11 and you want to give them a really good secondary career, there's nothing this site doesn't have that would do that. And I think that's always been the starting point. Um, the other options are more restricted. Um, the contract has got 10 years left to run. The building does sit uh, in, an, in a very low-lying area and um, the permissions were exceptions at the time in terms of its uh, alterations and additions in terms of the levels of the building within the floodplain. So there are, there are some restrictions. The intention is to sit down with Claremont. Um, Claremont have come to this with a positive and open mind and want to work with us to explore the feasibility of it working. Claremont have been using the City Learning Centre, which is on the site, which again is a very attractive modern building. They have been using that for their sixth form accommodation. So on the face of it, um, if you start with the young people in the school, this, this is really a very sensible thing to consider. The PFI makes it a bit more complicated, but having Having 20 years of working with the PFI and supporting the current PFI manager, Mary Johns, who again does a great job, I think we can work through those. And my instinct is that we can make it work in PFI terms. So I'll stop there, Chair, and take any questions. Thank you very much, David. Um, are there any questions? I can see Councillor Brennan has one. Yes. Um, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much for, for your report. And I think we do need to... Um, be quite active about finding uh, good and productive uh, uses for this facility, um, which is costing us, I think it says in the report, 830,000 uh, per annum. Um, uh, I was looking at some uh, ONS data uh, earlier today um, about our 16 to 19 population um, in the Wirral, uh, which we increased by 1,000 by 2024 uh, and will increase by 2000 uh, by 2030. Uh, and I'm aware of the fact that um, the Department for Education are making additional capital available uh, to 16 to 19 providers uh, to extend uh, their teaching capacity to be able to co accommodate that change in demographic. Uh, now it crossed my mind um, that it's possible that 16 to 19 providers uh, might want to take advantage of that opportunity um, and apply to the DfE uh, for uh, what is the equivalent of about uh, a new sixth form college, 2,000 additional uh, 16 to 19 year olds. Um, and uh, we've got a building which has a capacity of one and a half thousand which isn't being used and I wonder if there's some conversations to be had uh, around, I note in the options uh, in the paper, there's nothing mentioned about 16 to 19 in there. I wonder if there's some conversations to be had uh, with 16 to 19 providers and the DfE uh, to see if some sort of arrangement could be come to uh, to be, use this facility for uh, 16 to 19 provision, which, for which we know there will be significant additional demand. Thank you, Chair, um, through you. Um, because I don't work in the Children's Department anymore, I'm not fully up to speed with the numbers. So I think we would take that away and we would include that in the feasibility uh, study uh, and of other options that weren't considered in the paper. What I will say is, is the building has obviously been empty for some time now. And uh, in the, when the Academy first announced it was closing and we had the discussions with the DfE about some support funding, the one option that was looked at by the school's commissioner was to relocate another secondary school into the site, and that didn't, uh, that didn't reach fruition. We, we weren't involved in the discussions. Um, but also, no one has come along since. So, so I, but this is the first time that's been tabled as an option, so it needs to be taken away and considered alongside the feasibility. Um, and, and obviously, I defer to the director there for that. Thank you, Chair. And we are aware of the change of demographics and it's part of our planning. We, we know it's, it's, it's going to be a little difficult in that we know there is a bulge of pupils coming through before it's predicted to decrease again, so we need to, to bear that in mind. I think what we'd be saying, and it's, it's very much the importance of the feasibility study here, isn't it, as to whether this is the right place 
Clare Mountain and what the fit is. I think what we have to remind people is that Clare Mountain is quite a small school and this is a very large site. Uh, Clare Mount currently uses part of the building, the CLC, and again, I think there's a range of opportunities, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves uh, and, and start to plan what, what phase two is, but what I can say is if phase one is successful and Clare Mount moves in, we will be looking at phase two for the building about how we can maximise that use and potentially create that sort of diverse news based on the needs that we have in the borough. Thank you. So, so really we're talking about a feasibility study at the moment, which is the beginning of the work. And um, did you want to come back? Um, th thank you, Chair. Um, uh, and yes, I do take your point, Claremont uh, cl clearly isn't going to have the demand for the space that the site can offer. Um, so other uses need to be found. I guess uh, rather than think about this in a sequential way, as I think you Im implied in, in your response, uh, it would be helpful, uh, as David suggested, I think, uh, to concurrently explore uh, those 16 to 19 options. Uh, I'm not saying there necessarily is a solution there, but it feels to me like it definitely needs exploring, and given the uh, financial pressures on the authority, it's quite an urgent issue that, that we do so. That, that, that would be my suggestion. Thank you, Chair. I mean, again, Councillor Brennan, thank you for that. We agree. We will be explore exploring as many options as we can simultaneously, but the, the first option on the table is, is the Claremont one, which will be part of that feasibility study, but that will not stop us looking at all the other options at the same time. Again, the feasibility study needs to rule in and rule out, um, or at least give us other options about how we can use that building as we go forward. But we'll keep you up to date with it, and we'll certainly bear in mind that age group. I know we've been doing a lot of work around sufficiency, and I think there are a number of options on the table, but we'll fetch them all forward at the same time. Thank you very much. Oh, Councillor Cook. Yeah, I think this is probably a very simple point to address. It's just I noticed that the first reference to when the contract with uh, PFI runs out is 2031, and then it becomes 2032, uh, the beginning of page 191, uh, paragraph 4.1. Does that mean that by the very beginning of 2032, we'll be done with it? <laughs> is it just another way of, another perspective on, on when the contract runs out, or is it a mistake? Or Thank you, Chair. Yeah. To you. My understanding has always been that it's 2031. Um, I, I will check and come back to you, but my understanding is the contract runs out in 2031. It was a 25-year contract which was extended to 30 years uh, because of financial challenges and, and, uh, and, and issues in the very early phase of the contract. So I think it does finish in 2031. If it creeps over into 2032, it must be very early 30, 20, 2032. And of course, the other, th the other th although PFI has got a lot of facets, the other thing is the contract does require the building to be handed back to a certain set of standards. So every that's to stop the PFI contractor tailing off the care of the building towards the end of the contract. So um, although if, if Claremont or anyone else that relocates the building. We currently have the PFI contract. When it ends, the school becomes theirs, becomes the council's, or becomes theirs if they're an academy. Um, and it has to be handed back in a certain condition. So I, I think it's 2031. I've always called it 2031. I noticed that there. But if it is 2032, it's very early. But I will check the date, recheck the date with the contract manager. Thank you, Lou. Councillor Caribbean. Thanks, David. Um, just, just, just confirm to me again that it's got to be used for, for education, hasn't it? as a school is the first question and I've got a little yeah it does the, the contract requires it to be used for educational purposes we've had discussions with the PFI contractor over a period PFI partner um, we think it's perfectly reasonable for example to factor into the feasibility that a school or schools could occupy parts of the building but you could put other services like the visually impaired service or special needs service or the library service or whatever in other parts and you can still meet that education purposes definition. It, it's all to do with risk factoring back to the PFI uh, funders um, but on the other hand they have a bigger risk at the moment because they have an empty building so th I, think, I think we could arrive at a at a, a conclusion where education doesn't just have to mean all schools across the whole piece, as long as it's education related. I think they were, I think that's where we currently are with them. Um, if I may, Chair, um, I'm 
under the understanding that Claremont needs an awful lot of money spent on it in the next few years. So if this was to go ahead, do we have any idea of a time scale it would take to move them? Through you, Chair. Yeah, Claremont um, is a 1950s building which was clearly built to a budget in those straightened times. It's had lots of things done to it over the years and Claremont do a fantastic job with the building they've got um, and they make the absolute best of it. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's got more life behind it than in front of it. It's about the same age as me, I know the feeling. Um, um, it also sits on a very low-lying site. We had to lease a large part of the site to United Utilities to build a massive underground tank to hold water in terms of heavy rain. So it has a lot of factors that make it... To, you, you couldn't rebuild that building without taking the children and the school off the site. It isn't a good site to rebuild on, so therefore this move is desirable. The Kingsway accommodation is in very good condition, and as we've said, there's plenty of it. Um, because, it's, because it's not a special school that would require pool or therapy, um, provision. The alterations are relative to layout and bricks and mortar and possibly the addition of another lift and segregating accesses. Um, the, 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 the conversion of, of, of a large part of that building into a school is pretty conventional building work. There would be a need to put the IT back in because that wasn't part of the contract. But it is relatively straightforward. Uh, and and, and once this is, if this is approved, that we will do some feasibility work to show how that could be done. Um, you just have to reconfigure the building. So you'd, where you've got a suite of specialist rooms, you might reconfigure those, some of those back to general classrooms and so on. So you'd, bring, you'd, you'd take the space and bring it into one part of the building. It would actually turn out to be, a, I, I really think, it, you know, with the school's background, I really think it could make a, an excellent school for them. And, and also, um, I'm really pleased that the, the attitude they're bringing towards it because they've enjoyed using the City Learning Centre, which again is a high quality environment. So no, I think if it, if it needed therapy pool facilities under the PFI contract, that would have proved to be quite costly. But basic building work to the existing building, we don't, it doesn't need to be extended or, or the services added to or whatever, it's just a case of alterations to the existing building. Thank you very much. Oh, Councillor Collinson, I was just about to move that we, we <laughs> move on with this, but if you want to come in, thank you. It's just a quick one. Um, is the pan for Claremont going to increase, you know, the number on roll, or is that just fixed, you know, is, that, is there a need for it to extend? I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking it's 249 at the moment. Is it going to double? Is it going to, you know, decrease, I don't, you know, with re regards to the space? Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll fetch you some more detail on that with our school sufficiency work that we're currently doing. Um, we do have a pressure on, on special school places. We do need to look at making sure we have sufficient, and this would give us an opportunity, if needed, where the other building doesn't, to potentially increase that pan. But I wouldn't like to announce that or say that at this committee because it is based on the sufficiency and, and what we need. So it will be a look at the whole of our services rather than that school. But if that school needed to expand and this move was feasible, it would give us that opportunity as well. Thank you all. So I would like to move that the feasibility study takes place as in the recommendations. Councillor Caribbean and Councillor Cannon are both waving at me to uh, second it. So there we go. Thank you very much. Is that agreed? <coughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much. We move on to item number 12, which is about the domestic abuse annual report and hand over to Elizabeth Hartley, our Assistant Director for Early Help and Prevention. And I think that Justine's here too. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's been 12 months since we launched the partnership Domestic Abuse No Excuse strategy and tonight Justine and I would like to present to you the annual report and give you an overview of progress that's been made over the past 12 months. Um, I will speak briefly to the committee report which gives an overview of the changes operationally and strategically from the past 12 months and then Justine's just going to take us through the annual report which is um, much more focused on impact and the difference that it's made to people's lives in the borough. 
Um, so going to the, the committee report itself, the first piece of work that we took on as a partnership was trying to get into the right shape to deliver the strategy. So we fully reviewed the format and the operations of the partnership steering group. Uh, Justine took on the role of chair for that, which was great to move from being led by um, council officers to a, a third sector partner chairing the, the group. Uh, we established four subgroups. Uh, each of those has lay member representation on them as well, which has been really important to get that lived experience. So we have a, a voice group with lay member representation on the subgroups as well. Um, th those structures are supported by a practice development officer and there is a specific budget to support the, the partnership to be able to undertake pieces of work. Um, and we anticipate things like multi-agency training, etc., will be commissioned through the group. Uh, we've also reviewed the It's Never Okay website, which is our local domestic abuse website. Um, in terms of services, the strategy highlighted some areas where we had gaps in our partnership provision, particularly around perpetrator programs. Uh, so there's been significant amount of work done in the past 12 months. We've uh, launched the, the DRIVE programme for high-risk, high-harm perpetrators of domestic abuse. And there's an account of that in the annual report. Um, we've also secured funding from the Home Office via the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office for an early intervention programme for domestic abuse as well, which we're really pleased is a true partnership effort with seven third sector organisations coming together to work with the local authority to deliver this pathway for early intervention in domestic abuse perpetrators. Uh, another significant piece of work that we've done over the last 12 months is the We Can Talk About Domestic Abuse programme. Um, for people who remember the strategy and the co-production work that we did, there was a lot of victims and survivors spoke um, about quite often feeling re-victimised and alienated when having to uh, undergo statutory processes uh, with child protection. Uh, so what we did was we secured funding from the What Works for Children Social Care to test out a new approach to delivering our child protection processes, which brought family advocates working alongside families and practice professional support and social workers to help the uh, families to engage in the process, to be prepared for the meetings, to understand uh, what was happening during the process, to really enhance that co-production element. And we've done quarterly audits and learning events um, as part of the contracts with uh, What Works for Children and Social Care. And we've made some quite significant changes, particularly around the language that's used, the language that we write in our assessments, helping families to understand those processes. And we've had lots of um, the advocates and the families then contributing to the training materials that are being delivered to social workers and other professionals as well. Uh, so I think those are some things I wanted to highlight and I'll hand over to Justine. Thanks, Justine. Thanks, Elizabeth, and, and thank you for letting me come along. Um, in my day job, I'm CEO of a third sector organisation. But a year or so ago, I volunteered to, to chair the Domestic Abuse Alliance because I've been involved for probably over 10 years. And, and this really felt like something very different to what we've had in the past. It felt that we'd, we'd really listened to survivors and we'd got them involved and we'd, we'd co-produced a piece of work and, and learning from that to help us move forward. So I was really excited to, to chair the, the partnership and the alliance moving forward. And I think the report just covers so many amazing things that have happened over the past year. But what I wanted to do was just highlight some of the things that have happened that, that really stick out for me. I think the first point definitely is about the voice of the victims. I think without listening to victims that we, we can't move any further. And, and I have to say, having victims at, at the Alliance meetings and the various partnerships and, and things that go on really gives a completely different perspective. Um, and it's, it's amazing to hear and listen and see them become involved and feel comfortable sitting in a meeting, in their words, with a lot of professional people. 
Something else that we've managed to do in the past year is open um, Wirral's first domestic abuse drop-in centre for families. Um, it's really critical that a lot of our families have multiple children, as in five plus, so that they have somewhere to go and feel safe and be able to go with their children. Um, and that space that we have, which is the Lighthouse Centre on um, New, New Chester Road, is also co-located with the Paul Lavelle Foundation for um, male victims of domestic abuse. As part of the um, IDFA team, what we've been able to do is also allocate some specialisms within the team. So the specialisms are around young people, older people, people and male survivors, which is critically important to be able to expand the provision within that team. One thing that stuck out to me was um, around our COVID response, and I know a lot of the conversations through this meeting has ha have happened. Um, this building holds 814 people. But in the past year, through the COVID response, we've managed to support 1,647 people. So twice the amount of people that would fit in this building have been supported in the past year. So I'm quite a visual person, so that meant a lot to me. We've done a lot around target hardening and multi-agency work because people need to feel safe in their home. If you're a victim of domestic abuse, you have the right to feel safe. Quite a lot of the time, perpetrators will know where the spare key is or where the latch doesn't work on, on, a, uh, on a window. So around target hardening means that we can support people to feel completely safe in their home with preventions around alarms and et cetera that will help them feel safe. Elizabeth mentioned the drive programme. So currently there are 51 um, high level perpetrators that are engaged in that programme. But the ripple effect is that there are 56 victims and 108 children. So I think really by working with just those 51 men, it shows the ripple effect within the family, the wider family and the community that that level of intervention brings. I just wanted to pick out those and I think I'd like to say thank you to Elizabeth because she's brought a real, pardon the pun, drive to domestic abuse moving forward. Um, and, it, and it's a really, really exciting time. There is so much happening at the moment which can ultimately only make we're all a better place for victims and survivors. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, um, any members got questions, comments? Councillor Cannon. Um, thank you. I can't believe it's been a whole year. It's just flown by. Um, I, I know that you're asking us to be very cautious into interpreting the data, but I think I can't help but be excited. I think it's absolutely phenomenal what you've managed to do in the decreases um, and the protection of, of those, those women and young people is just amazing. Um, it was the next steps as well about this in investment in um, trauma-enforced practice across the workforce. I didn't know if you could just maybe just elaborate on that a little bit, just because I was really interested in it. In it. But again, I think, as well as that question, I think just to thank everybody for this amazing work. I said it's so exciting, so thank you. If I can pick up on the, the trauma-informed pr practice aspect, it's incredibly important. Um, some of the work that's also happening within the partnership at the moment is uh, we're undertaking um, a domestic homicide review. Um, and the case which we're, we're currently working on, which will be published within probably about three or four months' time, you can you get a really good understanding of how people who have experienced trauma like domestic abuse, the impact that has on their ability to engage with and access services which is one of the things that's most important for this group, those people that um, may seem like they, they, they don't want to engage or they want to hide things, but the impact of the trauma and the need for the wider workforce to understand this is, is really critical. So there's a piece of work happening underneath the Partnership for Children, Young People and Families around um, adverse childhood experiences and trauma-informed practice. Um, which we're working on alongside colleagues from public health and looking at a tiered approach uh, with different levels of training and awareness from the basic awareness right through to enhanced understanding. Um, so it's, it's, it'll be quite a significant piece of work. Uh, initially, we've got funding from the Violence Reduction Partnership for £75,000 to look at how trauma-informed some of our settings are, but there is a long-term piece of work that needs to be done to help understand the impact of that trauma, particularly with asking for help and then being able to engage in services. Thank you, and I'm sure the committee will be really interested to, in the feedback from that. I think that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councillor Caribia. Yeah, I'd just like to congratulate you both because I think this is um, an area that's been moving along a pace and it's, it's been really, really good. Um, for me, I, I had a piece of casework with a family that have gone through this system um, for the last two couple of years, um, children in leapfrogs and, and various things. She was so impressed with this. You're talking about being able to sit in a room and talk to other people. That she's actually that the mum has gone to university and passed her qualifications. She's coming back to do sit in the seat and talk to other people because she's been through that system and been through that situation, um, which I think is a brilliant sort of uh, flag wave and exercise for you guys. So congratulations! I think it's brilliant. I'm looking forward to the results later on. So would you mind if I just come back just to note that um, what we've learnt from people has been incredible and how generous they've been with their experiences, with guiding us about what would make a difference and contributing to, to training, to language development. It's, they've been incredible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I've got Councillor Cook and then Councillor Wright. Yes, uh, well, I wanted to echo Councillor Kurabia's uh, comments and congratulate everybody involved. Um, and also, the, the report right is including all the case studies and the, you know, which really made it real, to use a simple terminology. Um, and also, I, I noticed, I do recall about two and a half years ago when I first was elected, coming to the Children's Committee and listening to Paul Boyce expressing reservations about the zero tolerance you know, approach to this whole area. And it seems to me that the, 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 the new sort of title of this philosophical approach of uh, domestic abuse is no excuse, but at the same time it's not okay. You know, that nuance difference seems to come through in everything that's been doing involving the, um, you know, the perpetrators as well, who often, well, always need support of one sort or another. So I think it's most welcome. Thanks very much. Yes, I'd also like to echo the work that you're doing. I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, thank you so much. I just wanted to draw you to priority two, increasing safety for those at risk without adding to the trauma. I noticed there's um, a pilot, a new approach to deliver child protect process. You talked about that. And I'm interested in the employment of domestic abuse family advocates. Could you talk about the role? Is that their role to you know, increase a better understanding, I think, and engagement with people to get to the nitty-gritty issue. Yes, uh, we deliberately sought out um, people for the role who had experience either as, as mentors or volunteers or lived experience of either domestic abuse themselves or child protection processes. Um, we thought it was really important for families to, and, and we learned this through lots of the early help work that we talked about before, about having somebody who's been there, who understands, who's non-judgmental, that they kind of recognise and can share experiences with. So we recruited the family advocates based on, on that concept, and the role they've played has been fantastic. Um, they just, um, it's, I don't know if you want to add to it, Justine, but they just add a dimension, um, very common sense, very you know, practical, very down to earth, really engaging. But they help families to kind of navigate the process, to understand what's happening, to prepare for meetings, to read papers and understand what that means, what's going to happen next. And that's really taken a lot of the fear out of the statutory processes for families. Um, it's somebody that's been through it that can guide them, so it's been a really important role. I think what they've brought Excellent. is the realism of that experience and a dynamic that as professionals we can't bring unless we've had that lived experience and, and, and the, the real positive challenge to us as well that, uh, that in ways that we may not have thought was the solution or, or the potential solution. And I think they've been able to walk in the shoes of that victim understand those shoes as well uh, and be able to to not only sympathize I suppose but empathize with the journey that they're going on and and to know that you've got somebody by your side who's going to be there all the way through it is critical such a positive step well done thank you 
So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the report. Um, I just love how the uh, report is addressed to the people who are benefiting from um, this rather than just being a abstract sort of third person, you know. It's real and, that, and that's so important. Um, thank you very much for it. Thank you um, that it's helping us to meet some of our new duties under the new domestic abuse bill. And um, for all that's done, I'm very happy to move that we accept the recommendation. Is there a seconder? Councillor Cannon or Councillor Caribbean. All the members of the committee agree? Agree. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, so item 13 is the corporate parenting update. And um, the corporate parenting board has been meeting throughout the year. And Hannah has pulled together a report just to cover what we've been up to. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, I'm sure most of you have met me before, but just for those who haven't, I'm Hannah Myers, uh, an improvement manager within Children's Services. I currently support the work of the Corporate Parenting Board, and so I'm going to present the report on behalf of those members of the board. Um, the, the purpose of the report is to provide an update to the Children's Committee um, on the work of the Corporate Parenting Board since 2019. Uh, no previous reports have been brought to the committee since the past two years, so we're going to cover the work over the past two years with a view to be bringing annual, annual reports to the committee. The role of the Corporate Parenting Board is to promote and support the interests of children looked after and care leavers and make sure um, our services are in place to meet their needs. The board does have a duty to promote the seven principles of corporate parenting, which are set out in statutory guidance, and these principles are set out within the report, within the agenda. Uh, it's made up of elected members um, so here today, care experienced young people, foster carers, senior officers from the local authority, health and the police. So over the past two years, the board has developed to become a very vibrant and child focused uh, board which champions the needs and wishes of children looked after across Wirral. Uh, members do play a proactive role in promoting those corporate parenting principles and in providing that really important critical friend challenge to monitor and drive change and improvement for the better to improve outcomes for children looked after. So just to highlight some of the achievements that, that we feel that the board has achieved over the past two years. So really owning and monitoring the corporate parenting strategy and the four priorities around accommodation, proven accommodation, supporting emotional health and well-being for children looked after, education and transition arrangements. And we feel that this has resulted in a number of successes relating to progress around improving accommodation for children looked after and care leavers with the development of the new provision for children with disabilities, children and young people with autism, and with obviously the new provision around children's homes in, across the borough. Um, also around the support and monitoring of a new mental health support offer for children looked after um, in terms of the work around the UMU development and over, overviewing of the development of swim and gym passes for care leavers as well as scrutiny of education outcomes and oversight of the, some really significant improvements in the timeliness and quality of personal education plans. The board has also helped to drive and support the development of the Care Leavers Hub, our space, which provides invaluable face-to-face -face help and support for care leavers and provides a range of opportunities for skill development and socialisation. In terms of just one of the challenges for the board, um, it's been quite difficult to build some constructive relationships with young people because of some of the restrictions resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. But most recently, we held a COVID safe meet and greet with young people and members of, and included members of the board. And this is something we want to continue in the future. It provided a really good opportunity for that interaction, hearing the wishes and feelings of, of young people young in, who are looked after. In terms of moving forward then, um, the board has already had a development session to look at priorities for a new children looked after and care leavers strategy in terms of setting out new priorities and plans for the next three years. And this will help to really drive the work program of the board and really support its, uh, its in constructive direction for the future. 
We'll also be launching a corporate parenting campaign uh, using members of the board as our champions to raise awareness of those corporate parenting principles uh, and our responsibilities around children who are looked after. So that's a bit of a summary of the report of, uh, that was written and an overview of the work of the board. Um, members are requested to consider and comment on the information contained within the report and the presentation today and agree to receive a further report back to committee uh, on the work of the board within one year. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, corporate parenting is one of those really high priorities that we have as, as elected members, but also all council employees um, to care for and promote the well-being of our children looked after. Um, do any members have comments, questions? Councillor Cannon. Um, I think more, it's more of a comment about experience. I think going to our space and talking to our care leavers is hugely eye-opening. I think of the way that they drove um, the skills and learning that they wanted. So I spoke to several uh, young people who'd wanted um, like dressmaking and, and you know uh, those sorts of creative classes and others that wanted more sort of cookery classes and the, the way that they drove that and managed to, with the help and support of the workers there, managed to actually get the funding in place to deliver that um, with support of... of um, Sorry, my words have gone today, but with sorry, with the support of the college, that's the word I was looking for, with the support of the college, and I think I found that really kind of, it, it was the way that it was doing, I think we talk a lot about co-production, but I think when you actually sort of go into their space and they tell you what, they, what they've what they gained from that, I think despite COVID and despite everything else, I think that was quite phenomenal. Um, so I think it's just a plea to the rest of all of the councillors, not just the councillors in Children's Committee, for their responsibility to support that moving forward. So I think it was more of a comment than anything else. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. And as we, we move forward the corporate parenting campaign, um, that hopefully will help other elected members to become more aware. Councillor Caribbean. Thanks, Chair. I, I'll just, to follow on from, from uh, Councillor Cannon there, I think for me being on this committee for such a long time and being a, on corporate parenting, to see the difference between when I started to where we are now with the children is huge. I mean, when I started on this committee, we were, I hate to say this, but it was like discussing what we were going to let these children have. And now we've got to the stage where we're asking, well, we're not asking them, they're telling us what they want. And we're trying to, you know, give them what they're after, um, which is a far better way of doing things, I think. Um, and again, you, you can see the difference in them from day one when we started doing this. It's been massive. Um, and again, the likes of Poppy is, is just a real success story. And if we can get a few more going down that route, it would be great. Yeah, indeed. And, and just the whole success of having our space up and running, which has been in the making for such a long time and so much wanted and desired. Um, so it's really positive, I would agree. So I'll move the recommendation, and with thanks to Hannah and the team. Yeah. If I may, Chad, I've got to say it again. Being a corporate parent is all of our issues, all councillors, not just the ones that are on the committee. Um, I keep saying this because there's a lot of councillors who don't believe they're corporate parents, so I would like to see more councillors getting involved if they could. Do you have a particular suggestion? Uh, yeah, I, w I would like to see a presentation done at council, full council, to the councillors about being what being a corporate parent entails and means as a councillor. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Crubia. Thanks, Chair. I think that's an excellent uh, suggestion. I'm happy to take that away. And perhaps work together as a board to deliver it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, that could be very good. I know in the past we've won workshops for all elected members. I can think back quite a lot of years to that happening. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe <laughs> a full council, they've all got to be there. <laughs> uh, with the per kind permission of the mayor and so on. But yes, we'll uh, can look into that. Um, thank you very much. So if I move the recommendations, somebody going to second it, Kate's going to second it, and uh, we're all in favour. Thank you very much. We we'll look forward to hearing from you in a year's time, Hannah. Thank you. 
And finally, we come to the work program, um, which is maybe going to change. But. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Members, um, the purpose of this report, as you are aware, is to ensure that you have the opportunity to contribute to the delivery uh, of the committee's annual work programme. Um, the report lists a number of items that are already uh, on your work programme, um, but this is an opportunity for you to comment on those items or to uh, indicate if there's anything further you'd like to add to the work programme. Shall we... Um take it that members will pass to the spokes anything they wish to add um, in the light of current developments. And, uh, okay, Councillor Brennan. Can I just suggest an amendment to the recommendation that we delete the words adult social care and health and insert the words children, young people and education? I think that's an excellent plan. And uh, yes, it slipped through somehow. With that in mind, we'll move the recommendation. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, are you moving it, Councillor Brennan? Why not? Yep. Okay, thank you. And on this occasion, I'll second. Thank you very much. And members agree. That brings us to the end of our agenda, members. Thank you very much for your attention and time. And uh, good night. Maybe happy Christmas. <laughs> Although I may see most of you before Christmas, but not at this committee. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>